you just shake your head yes, even if you don't know what they're mm -hmm. saying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in that situation too much. <laughs> Maybe we're just all mumblers. Who the hell is this? Yeah. Um, all right. Ugh. Hello, that picture's here today? Yeah, but... Okay, you can put them here, but I have a meeting right now. So, but she's not here today. You can put them right there. Okay. How's everyone feeling? Everyone ready? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Uh, once I click start the webinar, I'll just wait about uh, 10 or 15 seconds to start speaking and then I'll, uh, I'll start. Sounds good. Hi everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us for our last virtual program for NADA Miami 2020, a conversation between artist Basira Khan and EFA Robert Blackburn Printmaking Workshop Studio Coordinator, Jasmine Kavasus, speaking about Khan's new suite of prints presented at NADA Miami with EFA. Basira Khan is a performance and visual artist based in Brooklyn, New York. Their work sublimates colonial histories through performance and sculpture in order to map ge geographies of the future Khan's latest solo exhibition, Snakeskin, opened at the end of 2019 at Simone Subal. They have exhibited in numerous locations, such as the Munich Documentation Center for the History of National Socialism, Jenkins Johnson Project, Sculpture Center, Aspen Museum, and Participant. Khan's performance has premiered at several locations, including the Whitney Museum of American Art and Art Pop Montreal International Music Fest Festival. Khan recently completed a six-week performance residency at The Kitchen and also recently was awarded the Brooklyn Museum Wovo Prize. Their works are part of several prominent permanent collections, including the Guggenheim, the Cottest, and the Walker Art Center. Khan's work is published in four columns, New York Times, The New Yorker, Art Forum, Art in America, Bomb, The Brooklyn Rail, and TDR Drama Review. Khan is an adjunct prof professor of sculpture, performance, and critical theory and received an MFA from Cornell University and a BFA from the University of North Texas. Jasmine Kadasus is the workshop coordinator and print collaborator of the EFA Robert Blackburn Printmaking Workshop. The EFA Robert Blackburn Printmaking Workshop is a nonprofit cooperative printmaking workspace located on the second floor of the EFA Center. The workshop provides professional, professional quality printmaking facilities to artists and printmakers of every skill level. Their facilities include all traditional printmaking techniques as well as risograph and digital printmaking techniques. Their mission is to expand the creation, understanding, and collection of fine art prints by providing access to affordable workshop space, unique education opportunities, and publishing the work of underrepresented and established artists. If you have any questions during the conversation, please write them in the chat, and uh, Jasmine and Basira will be answering them throughout the conversation. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass the screen over to Jasmine and Basira. Thank you. Thanks, Max. Thanks, Max. All right, what's up, Basira? Hey. How are you feeling? I'm feeling pretty good um, on this rainy day in New York City. So um, I figure we'll just start talking, uh, chat, start with 
the work you did here at the shop and then we'll move from there. And anyone out there in not a Zoom land, uh, feel free to type in any questions or comments and um, to keep this uh, combo rolling. Yeah. So um, you came in to the shop or um, came to work with us with our printer, John Andrews, to mm -hmm. do three screen prints um, mm -hmm. that were reproductions or, well, they're originals of your psychedelic prayer rug series, mm -hmm. um, which are prayer rugs that you uh, that you made that are also editioned. Do you want to talk mm -hmm. a little bit about the rugs first? Um, sure. And their translation to print? Um, so I was busy preparing for my first kind of debut of really a substantial body of work in New York City. I was working with this nonprofit organization, Participant Inc. Um, and curator and founder, Leah Gagetano. And we kind of were thinking through all these different kinds of prints, um, textiles, sculptures, performances. And one thing that I was messing around with was this kind of idea of reinterpreting the found object that is a prayer rug into my own sense of being. And I had or had these designs. And when Leah saw that, she was like, whoa, what's this? We need, we need this in the show. So that's kind of how, how it like, I wasn't intending on putting in the show because I do a lot of busy work stuff that no one sees. So I didn't intend on anyone seeing that particular work. So that's a little bit how like the artwork in my life goes. Someone's like nudging me, like you need to do this. Right. And so um, I was able to um, meet with a traditional Islamic rug makers in Kashmir. And they are these like amazing craftspeople that have been doing this kind of work for centuries. And so my idea around collaboration and working with craftspeople is that why would I want to learn and enter into an arena when there's these like amazing people who've been doing this work for like centuries. Right. So um, I, you know, invested my time and re my relationship with that. And that's how the first set of rugs came about. And then I was able to do a second set in 2018. So that show was 2017. And then the next set happened in 2018. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I'm curious, um, instead of just having, you know, one rug of each image made, right? You know, yeah. um, which is I think really interesting because like, Prayer rugs are, although they're like really common and ubiquitous, right? Um, objects, but they're also like in like individual and like um, intimate, right? Mm -hmm. Someone has like their rug, and you chose to do it in a set of multiples. Mm -hmm. this. Um, was there any specific reason you did that with the um, embroidered rugs? Yeah, you know the thing that's interesting. I was going to say one more thing is that on the way to fabricating these rugs. Um, I was sending uh, the Illustrator files through my iPhone to the um, person who was managing the project in Kashmir and they had an iPhone. And so we were able to do like color and quality control through this iPhone screens. And basically they um, printed, screen printed the designs onto the canvases before they started embroidering the designs just to keep consistency. Um, so I think that it's interesting that, you know, here we are translating these wool and silk rugs now into prints. Right. Um, but in terms of the multiples, it's like the best thing I can really say is that I'm, I'm really interested in the way that my work can be experienced in different locations because every time a different body of people see the work, it has like a totally deeper, different meaning. So it's different to see a prayer rug in New York City than it is in Aspen. Mm -hmm. It's different to see a prayer rug in Aspen than it is in Munich, Germany, and so on and so forth. And so I'm able to send out all these different rugs to all these different places at the same time. And then they're, they're all kind of like nodes that have these 
conversations together. And I, and that's why I think, you know, additions are so interesting to me. Um, so someone asked a question before mm -hmm. you. Um, would you add, would you say, would you try to say the person's name? Michael Ralph. Oh. Michael Ralph asked, how do you think about your training and your influence in terms of the techniques you use and the arguments or messages in your work? Is your formal training how you think of your training or do you have a lot of diverse influences beyond that? Mm. Let's answer that first. And um, I may not, I may not, I have like short-term memory weirdness. So I'm going to try to remember it backwards, um, the question. But I think like I clearly have formal, I mean, it's not clear, nothing's clear. You guys don't know me. Um, I, I do have formal training. I went to a uh, painting school and I studied sociology. And then I went to graduate school and it was like an architecture school. But then I was doing like sculpture and painting within the MFA in that in at Cornell University. So I do I believe I have a pretty substantial amount of formal training, also with art history. But I actually pull from like weird moments in my personal life where I experience something, it's like a material or like some sort of phenomenological experience that I'm having. And I'm like, wait, like I'm experiencing this thing. And I know for a fact that like, millions of other people are experiencing this at the same time right so that's when I really hone in and I'm like I need to do something with this um so I, I hope that starts to answer your question Michael uh and he has a second part he says do you feel do you favor classical or canonical canonical training or feel like artists from the global south or elsewhere have been equally influential that's a good Oh my gosh. Um, it goes back to what I'm saying is that I, I think that my influences are my lived experience. And I guess you could say it's a privilege that I am not merely American. I'm, I am of the global South. I'm cut from multiple cloths and hell yeah. Like classical canonical master paintings. I usually look at those when I need comedy in my life comedy um, yeah there's something there there's a comedic kind of tone to all the master paintings for me um i i usually become quite cynical when i see master paintings because i kind of think about how you know right now in the contemporary art scene we have all these like interesting like artists coming to the scene but then at the end of the day we're all coming to the scene having this been like always like a colonial project because mm -hmm we, um, some of us who follow, like, where do the galleries come from, whatnot, we all, we know that it was, um, you know, like a Dutch trade situation where there's all these, you know, Dutch uh, classic people that had all of these items that they wanted everyone to know that they had. And so they would, you know, create patronages with painters and they would have these painters, um, you know, show to the world what what their belongings were or what they had um, and that was kind of the first like capitalist gallery painting kind of still life narrativized like um uh scenario that would happen and then you know it's like i think i remember when i first moved to new york in 2007 i um i i watched that um really terrible documentary it's like a 10-part series on new york okay yeah. yeah and i i learned in that series that the dutch came over you know to collect fur and trade fur but new york city itself or the new york area itself didn't have a church for like 10 to 15 years past their uh uh, em uh embarking on the land and um, it wasn't until the British came in and like colonized on top of the Brit on top of the Dutch that the first churches were built. Okay. And and so I just like think about um, I think about those things when I'm thinking about these kinds of questions. 
Um, but just know that like for me, I'm, I'm not thinking about traditional materials. I'm not thinking about legacies. I'm trying to build my own legacy. So that would be like the short answer. Yeah, it doesn't, I mean, your work doesn't feel, um, you're not building on traditional. I'm not really building on traditional, like I'm not, I'm not really looking at traditional materials. I'm not really, um, you know, there isn't really a legacy for me per se. And so I'm kind of building my own legacy on my own terms. Um, and I do like um, kind of collage elements of other artists into my world so I can have kind of a historical foundation. I do that, but I'm primarily just kind of pulling and pushing from experiences I have in my daily life. Right. Someone's asking if we can like show the rugs and prints. So I'm just gonna like share my screen really quick. Sure. That's cool. And um, about another thing I find really interesting about this project and we'll move on from the rugs, but um, that they are like performative objects as well, you know, mm -hmm. like used in ritual and how, like, how does that, did you think about that or consider that? Because part of your practice is also performance, right? Mm -hmm. And when you were considering embarking on this project, did you ever even use them in performance or have that kind of, I don't know. Like it's, that, that's, that's, that's kind of a cool question because I, sure. it's not like, it wasn't like a grand plan, but I do think the objects I put out in the world have their own sense of performativity. Does that make sense? Where like the, um, whereas the acoustic blanket is a suit that I get under to perform right. in. The, um, there's like a, you know, with the rugs, there's a built-in performativity to them because it's a found object that most people understand what it is. Um, and most people know that they are supposed to step upon it and kneel. Um, and so you don't have to actually do that because that's already in our imagination. And so that's what I mean by the object has its own sense of performativity. Mm -hmm. um, so that might be, you might be writing my artist statement for me right now because that's kind of how I pick and choose what I hone in on to make. Right. So here, can you see this? If yeah. You like my screen. Okay. So here are the rugs, which are really wonderful in, in person. Also, anyone out there in New York, our gallery is open. These are installed in our gallery. So if you'd like to come by, shoot us an email. Um, so, oh, well, here are three, the three that are installed, but these two have an addition. So let's see if I can um, pull up the addition. Oops. Um, so what was your experience? So the rugs and the prints, both edition, what would you say are the differences or similarities between doing those and coming in and working with our printers here, with our printer, John Andrews here, who's an amazing oh. human? Well, we had a really hard time choosing the color for I Am A Body. Right, cause there's so many. And there's kind of a funny um, story behind the color of the rug. So I was trying to figure out how to get my color of my skin onto that rug. I'm going to pull it up here. And so I actually went to a makeup consultant and uh -huh. I mean, that's not the cult. That's, that's a, yeah, there's yeah, the, like several the different, prints, but yeah, there's di different, um, flesh tone. but, um, I'll just scroll through them. Yeah. I went to a makeup consultant. Um, and they got my skin tone to, to get makeup made for my skin tone. And then I took that and I converted it into a CMYK. And then I il did an illustrator file of the design. And then I made a PDF and sent it through WhatsApp to my person in Kashmir. So that's like my process, right? So then they make the rugs um, by dyeing the wool and, you know, matching the string up against the the phone and being like, okay, this is the right color. This is the right color. 
maybe we should do three different swatches. Which color is the right color? I mean, this is the process I did with John Andrews as well, right. trying to match the color. Um, and then at some point, you know, the rugs come to me and it's always like, I don't know what the rugs are going to look like because we've had this plan, but I'm not there. So it is what it is, right? So the rugs come and I'm like, it's orange. <laughs> so um, That's up right now. This is the original. Yeah. Like the orange. I mean, I call it original. I don't call it orange. I call it original. Right. Yeah. So this is your skin tone. This one it's supposed to be right it's supposed <laughs> right. to be and and you know it's this is the big enigma um with media is you can never get skin tone right so so i think it's awesome that you did them i mean here's the black on black but in like various skin tones mm -hmm. um, with dark brown this. light brown right I mean, I peaches. peaches yeah um and do you want to talk a bit about this piece, the I am a body piece. Um, well, I mean, I think that uh, some of these po some of these um, protest symbols are pretty baked into our um, national identity and um, popular consciousness. And so it might, you know, it might just take us into a completely different world, but right. yeah, I'm look I can just say briefly and generally that I'm looking at protest posters and moments of um, uh, demonstrations and graphics that were meant to um, promote sovereignty mm -hmm. um, and dignity. Um, and so, you know, and then I interpret it through my own lens, through my own body, through my own experience. So, which is, you know, also interesting in like this thread, like they started as rugs, but inspired by, um, it was like protest posters and imagery. And we're going back to screen print, which is like the original yeah. protest poster. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting conceptual loop here because yeah. I, I am not a printmaker. I, I have a kind of sensibility for collage. And mm -hmm. so I think that John Andrews and I also, um, thought through the prints as collage, because right. if you can go to, um, yeah, so the one that we're looking at right now, um, the I'm as good as you are, yeah. the green and the microphone and that little area, that's yeah. actually like stamped onto a nude piece of paper because we printed everything on black paper. Right. And so, so in my, in my opinion that I'm thinking at, I'm thinking about print in a sculptural way. Uh, in you know in collage sculpture I know those are two different things oh, you're like I, building upon like upon material even though it's all you know 2d but, like yeah. you know a sculptural approach when you're like there are many layers right um mm -hmm. and uh, and the same here the 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 Urdu text is there's no ink there right like you just printed the 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 white area. Mm -hmm. right. And you can really see yeah. that when you when you have the privilege of seeing them in person, you can really, really see that. Everyone can see them. Um, and there were there were some like complications with printing on black. So we had to buy special paint. It's like, I think, I believe the paint's called Jacquard. And it's this really sultry, like kind of almost sexy paint. It's just like, it looks like a ball gown, but it's paint. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but, you know, we had to play tricks. So in order for the yellow to look right, we had to put white underneath first and then put yellow on top. And then in order for other colors to look right, we had to actually do green and then put something on top of green. So right. there were just there was just like this weird like veiling of colors to get to the right color that we had to do. And uh... I know this piece, um, because of conversations we've had in, had in the past, is like a collage of different uh, concepts you had, like with the, the yellow rectangle as a reference to National Geographic, like magazine, like the Urdu text, um, which you, told, you explained the meaning to me in the past, plus the pink um, pyramid, which is a reference to ACT UP posters. Mm -hmm. right? um, and 
So they are almost like protest posters too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's really um, wonderful. Okay. So I want to stop that. Um, they are really great. So yeah, what else? So this was something that we worked on during this wild COVID year. Um, it has been almost a year, right? It's a year almost, you know, like Crazy. I feel like the first case was around this time last year, no. Um, and what else have you been working on? Um, I, I did have a really productive and busy year. Um, uh, around August, I moved into a place called Queen's Lab, which is like kind of a large factory that's um, associated with uh, the kitchen, which is a nonprofit performance space. Where you also had a residency. It's, it was a res, so the way that the, the way that the organization was setting things up was, was inviting artists to come and do six week residency and they can program themselves in any way. Mm -hmm. There was a, there was an online component. So what I, had desired to do for a very long time is to make a film. But then as I was in bed with COVID, just kind of like watching the news, watching tons of TV, I realized like TV has always been the babysitter of the world. Okay. You know, it's the, it's the thing that you turn to when you want a distraction or when you want love or when you want, when you're angry or whatever. Yeah, yeah, right, right. And so I was like, you know, I want to like, look at the form of TV and make one on my own through the perspective of being an artist. So it's an experimental television show that I was able to produce with a team of amazing people called By Faith. And it will live eventually in the next two years. It will be post-produced and made into 10 different parts. So it'll be a 10 part series. And I'm working with the Wexner Center to do the post-production. So what this, what this TV show promotes is we're not really talking about COVID here. We're just like talking about living in this apartment that I'm in right now. And I've been here for 10 years and I've gone through all this life change and all this stuff. And I'm kind of sick and I'm in my bed and I'm having a fever. Mm -hmm. It's very Proustian. Yeah. It's like Proust writes seven novels about being in bed. I can do this. I can do 10 parts in a TV show, right? So while I'm in bed, I'm tossing and I'm turning and I'm having these fever dreams that all my friends are coming to hang out with me. We're dancing, we're cooking, we're like just chatting, you know, whatever we're doing. We're walking around the streets and getting strawberries at a bodega. You know, we're doing all this stuff together. Um, and then there's a little bit of oil and water with the TV series because some of the footage is 4K and it's very like kind of gorgeous and cinematic. And some of the footage is um, surveillance style. Mm -hmm. And so the surveillance style will connote that we are just observing Basira. And then the high end material will be like, oh, we're in Basira's head, we're in her fantasy. So that's kind of how we're like editing it. And then there's these transition scenes where I'm on the bed and I'm like struggling to sleep. So we're, we're gonna try to make it work. And I, I have clips if you want to share some of those. Yeah, I'm happy to. Here, okay. I'll um, pull up the links you sent me. Uh, do you have one that you want to show in particular? Because we have a couple years. So we have Brandon Strawberry Moment, Ethan Loading Basira Tent. Rich mm. How are you feeling? How about, how about we show the acrylic bed? Because that's um, that scene is crucial because that's the scene that's going to transition between me being in my head and me being kind of like in this space of surveillance. All right. Um, awesome. Should we go? Go ahead. Yeah, let's go. All right, awesome. Let me share my screen again. So this is just like a very short clip and the color is muted because we have to colorize after we lock picture. And what you're seeing is I wanted the house itself, the apartment itself to play as a character who's observing me. 
And so the best way I could come up with was like building this 12 foot tall bed with an acrylic um, floor and then get on it and pretend like I'm taking up actually was sleeping. Um, there's hours of footage of me doing that. So you have to pick and choose from, from all that. Um, get out of here. And then um, we could, we could um, if you go to the Amy Silman scene, that's a good scene because um, there's a sequence of Amy and I sitting at a table painting and then we're on the bed painting and then all of a sudden I'm by myself painting. So yeah. that's gonna be, go ahead. Go on. So that's like a, also like a really crucial way for me to be able to address the fact that we're kind of isolating, we're in our homes and we, maybe some of us are just like talking to ourselves or our kitchen knives or something. Yeah. <laughs> Is it labeled Amy and Flowers? Yeah. And so think about these videos as expanded episodes. So each character that comes in to hang out with me will eventually become its own 25 minute episode. You know, and I was like, you know, it's not gonna, it's not, it's not how I can pay my, it's not what I pay my rent with. Yeah, I, I would love a painting. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, I would love an Amy Summit yeah. painting. Um, and then maybe, um, I'm not sure if, it's so I'm, I'm in an awkward position because I'm talking to you guys on my phone and I can't see if anybody's watching us. I can just see you. And so I don't know if there's questions or if anyone's on this um, Zoom with us, but I feel like we should show one more and then we can go back to like chatting or qu answering questions. Yeah. And I, I think that the one that would be the most fun to watch would be the Rico scene because um, that scene is like the moment where I took COVID seriously was when like there's certain things that happen in this apartment that they're almost like spiritual things that happen like the bookshelf came crashing down like right before Cuomo locked the city down. And I have to, I have to say, I wasn't, be, I wasn't behaving badly. Like I had already stopped eating out and like traveling so much, but I, I still wasn't taking it that seriously. I was like, there's no way this is like, this is science, science fiction. There's no way the whole world is going to collapse. Right. But then the, then the books just go crashing down and I was just like, and I was having a dinner party that night. So everybody's like, and so we were all like, it's a sign. <laughs> and so in this video, I'm talking with my dear friend Rico about that moment. It's funny how, because of what's happening like in the outside world, what happens in our interior spaces, we perceive differently. Like any other time, you're, you're like, oh shit, I need a, a new bookshelf or whatever, but yeah. because there's so much chaos and uncertainty outside of our doors, that bookshelf was like, now it's a sign. You know, and it, and it happened right in the middle of a dinner party. I mean, like, what's the, what, that's just too, it's not just coincidental is what I'm yeah. saying. It's like, maybe your house is haunted. Juju. Yeah. Good, it's a good haunted, I think. Yeah. And it, and also like the words by faith are inscribed above my door when you walk into the building. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. there was a spiritualist that lived here before me. Yeah? Yeah. Um, it's totally haunted. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me, um, let me get this going. And all of a sudden, all the books came crashing down. It was just like, it was almost like, it was like, take these books, throw them on the ground. Just throw these, just, just throw want me to the throw ground. these books on the ground. Just throw them on the ground. That's very modern. <laughs> how loud it was. I mean, it was like, it was more, it was more. Let me throw this, let me throw this. It was like. Here. Maybe it was even louder than that. Oh, you want to try it again? It was like. 
for extra, the rental. For extra effect. This is by Fiden. Oh, yeah. Oh, that Screw like you, Fiden. Kind of a death. Screw you. I can't, I can't read Farsi. Yeah, so all the books fell down. Screw you, Thames in Houston. Hudson. Yale. Okay. You want to throw this one? No, you throw it. <laughs> threw you a uh, black and white checkered concrete cover. You just said threw you. Oh, screw you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't throw the ball. Okay. Yes. Okay. So that's what happened. That's what happened. The books fell down. <laughs> it ended up becoming like like some kind of institutional critique on publishing houses or something. <laughs> screw you, Yale. Screw you, Tame. I know. I was like, do you want to throw Yale? Because he went to graduate school at Yale. I was like, you want to throw this book? <laughs> um, yeah, what's this experience like for you to record yourself and it, it's scripted, more or less, um, mm -hmm. versus like your experience as a performance artist, like around people that's maybe a little more improvisational mm -hmm. um, around weird. these like objects that you've made, you know, like your uh, acoustic blankets series, right? So you like, you have these objects that you're making and you're performing with versus like making like almost like a set, like kind of, although it's like, you know, not a typical like sitcom set, you know, what's that experience? It was really hard actually. <laughs> um, and the, the links that I sent you earlier today is also a scripted performance I did for the Ribbon Foundation. That was really hard. So, so far the last two performances I've done have been scripted and I'm just like, no, mm -hmm. to memorize things. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I think it's, I actually think it's, it's um, making me a stronger performer um, because I can, um, I can always break from the script um, because it's my work, because I can do whatever I want. But um, it's helpful because now the production's getting a little higher and there's all these amazing people around me. So it's only respectful to, to have a script so that people can anticipate every move. Mm -hmm. So that's forcing me to have to, to get outside of my box and like, you know, think a different way. Yeah. Um... And you, and you do all the writing, or is it like, imp or like improv while it's recording? Right. So in, for example, the the performance at the Rubin Foundation, that was all my writing, mm -hmm. but there was a very crucial moment in say May, when the kitchen was like, "Do you have a script? What are you working on?" And I was also trying to hire the 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 sound person, the the lighting person, the cinematographer, you know director you know there's all these parts to making kind of something that's high production i was like i can't talk to anybody without a script i don't know what to do um and so i started writing a script and it was almost like me writing a young adult novel or something <laughs> it was just too detailed and it didn't feel like a script and so i started talking to my director ethan weinstock who's a dear friend of mine and we came up with a plan to create themes, create a scenario, have some kind of like mental plan of spontaneity within the, within the realm of like a planned uh, space and planned casting, and then just tape record it and then review the tapes and pull a script from that. Mm -hmm. And okay. there's this dude, Mike Lee, who's like a big producer person who does this kind of work all the time. And because I'm from Texas and I like ended up working with people in the film world in Austin, like living through the whole South by Southwest thing, I was really tuned into mumblecore. And a lot of this kind of filmmaking comes from creating a scenario and then just observing people and what they say and then pulling the script from that. So it was, it was pretty easy for me to transition. Um, and then there's new work that I have on showcase at Basel that are taking the backdrops and manipulating them into these structures and they now live on the wall. But 
I mean, I, I, I didn't send you those images, but they're like on my Instagram or it's okay. Okay. Stay um, tuned everybody. The, the backdrops that were in that, the last um, clip with Rico. Yeah. All those backdrops ended up becoming um, actual objects that will live on as sculptures. Right. Mm -hmm. So it is, you know, all of your practice sort of like object making and performance, mm -hmm. but on video. Yeah, no, I like, I like creating things in the world that come from something. They have a history. Yeah. So these, these backdrops have a history. They'll always be connected to the TV show. Right. Yeah. And um, I didn't get a, a good look at the backdrops, but what, what do they consist of? They look like they're also like kind of collaged. Mm. You know what I'm gonna do? Stuff, you know? Let's talk about other things and then I can email you the image. <laughs> okay, that's, that's awesome. Um, I like this idea of surveillance. Okay in uh, your work um, mm -hmm. from like a in very personal, like understanding of surveillance, like as if like the objects in your apartment or alive or maybe the spirit living in your apartment watching you um, as it relates to uh, um, like government surveillance, um, especially like in this, point um in our time with like muslim like surveillance you know um is that something you think about when you're thinking about that yeah no, i mean i i think that all all senses of injustice um are rooted in anti-blackness no matter where you are in the world mm -hmm. and one of the things i'm really excited about in um in this last uh you know, moments of our history, which is like unprecedented um, because, okay, so I just sent that to you. Um, so it's, it's unprecedented that um, we're in the situation. And, you know, um, I'm kind of a huge fan of Cornell West. Um, may he always be protected from whomever, but um, he actually did this talk with this organization, it's a South Asian organization, and I don't remember the name, but it was um, Shidi's and Dalits um, in Pakistan, India, kind of like South Asia area who are black and they don't come from, duh, they don't come from the transatlantic slave trade histories, but they are black and they are living within those environments elsewhere, right? And, um, you know, there's always this kind of notion that um, there's these other, it's, it's weird. It's like the diaspora of blackness sort of just like dissipates in American culture. It's like, it, it's weird to me because there's, there's other histories of, of displacement within like black cultures in other parts of the world. And those histories end up becoming a part of American history because of America's exceptionalism of inserting itself and inserting its power and its imperialism all over the world. So a lot of the fucked up things that are happening in India right now where Muslims are being murdered everywhere mm -hmm. is because a lot of that is connected to anti-blackness. Mm -hmm. um, and so here I am in America, la 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 la, and I'm like living in Texas seeing all this crazy stuff and now I'm in New York and I'm seeing all this crazy stuff and it's just really it's really overwhelming to um enter into a conversation that is um that doesn't like try to make space for all the different complexities of blackness mm -hmm. um and so one of those things is being muslim because when you think about Muslim, you think about the kind of Arab face, like that poster, the protest poster actually, right. which I looked at and deliberated upon mm -hmm. uh, of we accept refugees. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's like Syrians are essentially white. And I know that I'm gonna lose a lot of followers by saying that, mm -hmm. but you know, they're non-white, mm -hmm. right? It's if it, in America, it's like a very particular thing. In America, if you look a certain way, and you have the desire to assimilate, you can do it. 
Yeah, you're passing. It's like really common. It's yeah. a psychological thing. It's like if you want to pass yeah. and you think you can sleep at night and get a good night's sleep, go for it. Mm-hmm. That's America. And, um, and also it's the way Americans make their money too. And so, but, but really when you think about Islam, like Islam has been in the Americas since before it has been colonized by the Spanish and the Dutch and the da 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 and the British. And why, why is that? Like Islam created math and science. The Moors were already like, you know, at their peak and they were traveling all over the world. Yep. So it's really hard for me to stomach these ideas around Islamophobia in America and anti-Blackness in America because those are so intertwined and it's really hard for me to not, to have separate conversations. Right. So like being Muslim is, and being surveilled is duh. Like we've been, people have been surveilled in this country since, you know, there was capitalism and the inception of colonization in the country. Awesome. Um, so we're coming on 45 minutes, which is okay if we want to keep going, but do you, I can share what you recently, what you just sent me. They're kind of fun. You want to like that a little bit and then we can yeah. go from there. If anyone else has questions, ask them now. I don't want to like, I'm sure people don't want to let us talk forever. But, um, I don't think that you and I want to talk forever either. Yeah, that's true. I'll talk to you forever. Okay, I'll talk to you forever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm just going to open a few of these and then we can go through them. Oh, these are beautiful. Okay. All right. So let's see. Show my screen. And then we can end off with this. What's that? God damn it. Can we see everything? Mm-hmm, I can see it. Oh, that's that's the wrong one, but I don't know where that's coming from. Okay. Oh, that's from the participant site. Okay. Yeah. Trying to move that. Right. Okay, here we go. So this one was, I think this one was installed or is installed at Simone Sabal right now. And it was premiered at this online viewing room at Basel, huh. Miami. Mm-hmm. So these should... are the backdrops. So these, mm-hmm. these are the, awesome. Okay. That's very cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can see that little like triangle in the back is a microphone stand and there's illumination through a selfie ring light. Right. Um, And what I did was I prepared all the, all the nails on the wall are mapped and all the angles are mapped. And so whoever installs this work has to, has to install it based on the manual that I give them. I need something more. Now I'll open a few more. Um, is this your apartment? Yeah, they're all my apartment. There are different coordinates in my apartment based on feng shui readings. Oh. And the titles are coincide with that. Right. So that. So your, your work is very varied, but you do tend to have, um, you work a lot with textile, I've noticed as well, like from yeah. uh, your collages to the rugs, mm-hmm. um, your print. Mm-hmm. Thanks for sharing. These are great. Thank you. It's new work. Yeah. Awesome. We'll see where it goes. And finally, again, congrats on your, on the Brooklyn Museum. Is it Uvo? Am I saying that wrong? Uvo? Lobo. 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 Um, yeah. um, Thank you. That's so I awesome. hope I make good work, everybody. Well, Stay yeah. tuned. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's been really great, like, having you here um, at the shop and the work that you and John produce, the prints you guys produce. Thank um, you. Yeah. How long is the how long is the exhibition going to be up? I should know that, right? At EFA. Um, I don't know either. Um, honestly, 
that is an Essie question. Who's our exhibitions director? Okay. So sorry to ask. It'll be up for a minute, y'all. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. But it is up. All of you out there, come see it in person. They are truly beautiful, both the prints and the rugs. Um, and we are by appointment only. So just shoot us an email and come on by. We're located in Midtown, um, Manhattan, 39th Street. And yeah, my, anything else? We got anything no, else? No, I mean, here? unless I, I can't see who's watching us. So yeah, it, I can't see anyone. Okay. <laughs> and there are people there. Um, okay. yeah. Cool. Essie just said, Essie just said, thank you. Cool. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I would love to like, um, get a copy of this just so I could see who all was in there and what questions were that came up. Yeah. So I'd love that. All right, everyone. That's in fact, check yourself. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's the great thing about recording Zooms is I'm like, what did I say? Okay. Yeah, what did I say? Like, <laughs> did I look like a hot mess or not? Probably. But, no, <laughs> great okay. Great. Thanks so much, Jasmine. All right. Bye, Mr. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody.